Kia ora and welcome to Cinema in Context, where we discuss all things film and the connections between. My name is Jeremy Downing. I'm William Chan. I'm Max Tarrant. And I'm Sarah Watt. And each month of Cinema in Context, we usually discuss two films, one current and one retrospective, with some connection. However, at the end of the year, we like to change things up and appropriately talk about our top films for the year. Now this year, the way we're going to manage it is we're each going to go around and share with the rest of us our top three films for 2017 and have a little bit of a chat. So um, yeah, we'll start with Max, then Sarah, myself, and then finish with William. And it's worth noting that there are some films that have yet to come out in 2017 at the time of this recording. And a couple of those we felt were worth mentioning are Coco, which is the Disney Pixar film that's coming out on Boxing Day, Star Wars The Last Jedi, uh, which is a a little indie film that's coming out uh, in the coming week, and then we've got Paddington 2, which, Sarah, you've actually seen Paddington 2 in a previous screening. It was wonderful. Excellent. But not till Boxing Day, I think, isn't it? So Boxing Day seems yeah. to be the day where a lot of a lot of family fear comes out. That's right. So that's that's kind of how we're going today, um, and we'll just sort of see how we go, really. And it's worth noting as well that at Cinema in Context, we try and keep our discussion of new films spoiler free, and I think it's fair to say that we'll be doing that today. To the best of our ability. Excellent. And I guess it's worth having a caveat to that that even though it will be spoiler free, it's probably best enjoyed this podcast having seen most of the films. So, up to you. Right, let's start with Max. Max, do you want to jump on, jump in and share with us your your top three films of this year? Do, 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 do. Three, two, one. Number three. Well, this is going to be an interesting start. I think this film is going to be in a lot of our lists. It's a film uh, that is American. Uh, I feel like I should give you guys little clues and see when Ooh, you yes. get it. Oh. Um, it's a film that is about African Americans... Yeah. And their struggle. Get out. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, I gave it too easy. <coughs> yeah. No, I was telling you, get out. Yeah, get out. Yeah. Yeah. Get out of here. You picked that, Phil? Nice. So, um, mm. what's the name, Peel? What's his name? Jordan Peel. Jordan, mm. Jordan Peel, directed by Jordan Peel. Uh, came out relatively early this year, um, but it was a major film, wasn't it? Everybody loved it, um, critically and popularly supported. And we all loved it, didn't we? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Mm. And am I allowed to ask now if it's in other people's things? Oh, no, I guess that ruins it. No, out. no, I'm not, not going to share okay. that. Okay, you're not going to tell me that. No. So if we can assume that people have seen it, and if you haven't, you totally should, what did, what did you love about it? What makes it your number three of the year? Um, I mean, it had a lot of uh, political relevance at the moment, and, and I think that is a key thing theme of my picks, mm-hmm. that a lot of things are going on at the moment, racially and in terms of gender politics, and so race has kind of gone off the boil a little bit, and particularly from our perspective in New Zealand, although I think it's probably still going on a lot in America, but Charlottesville was huge, um, and then I just feel like this year's a year of kind of some big political shifts. Mm. You, you see that? I feel- absolutely. see that in art. Um, with musicians and films and television that there is a real, almost like a return to that sort of 1970s, 60s, uh, the placement of art and that it's mm. pushing back mm-hmm. against the the systems and the regimes that control us or, or, or not control us, uh, but dictate our lives. Mm-hmm. And the politicisation of film again, sort of, yeah? It's yeah, really exciting. Yeah, a, it is good. In a weird way though, because you've got big blockbusters <clears> like Ghost. Ghostbusters doing a female remake and mm. Wonder Woman that are pushing back in a kind of subtle way. They're still mm. part of the system mm. very much, yeah. but finding ways to change the discourse. Mm. And they have changed the discourse, I think. Mm. Well, not on their own, but they've been part of a real shift. And now we've got things like Me Too, hashtag Me Too. Mm-hmm. I think there's a connection there between sure. what's going on in the pop culture world and um, what's going on, I don't know. And then you have the much more explicit things like Get Out, like um, Detroit and Handmaiden's Tale, which, Mm. I mean, that's going straight out there. Yeah, and there was a big uh, slew of uh, African-American films, just trying to think of some of that, I'm Not Your Negro, Mm. that were in documentaries and things like that, Um, Call Me, oh, there's one about a jazz musician, Mm. Call Me Melvin, I think it is. that have come out this year about race politics. Mm. Should we move on to number two? Sure. Yeah. Number two. <laughs> Am I going to get the same one every time? Probably not. Uh, number two is The Killing of a Sacred oh. Deer. Woo! 
<laughs> I, have, I knew it. I have not really? seen this film. I, oh. I so want to see it. I just didn't have time in the final week. Of oh, you my, haven't seen it? No. Oh. I so wanted to see it. Mm-hmm. I realize I haven't written down his the director's name. Jorgos Lanthimos. Thank you very much. And he was the director of... The Lobster. Thank you. And Dogtooth. And Dogtooth. Yeah. This is amazing. The synchronization of our, of our sharing yeah. oh, of knowledge. Yeah. Well, we're just so knowledgeable. And we're we? just so in tune. That's true. You know? Yeah. Podcast yeah. 21, I think. Is that 21st birthday? Is it? Oh, there we go. We're growing up and yeah. we're, you know, synchronizing a bit more. Um, <laughs> so what are some of the reasons, Max? Well, you, I, This I, is your number two film. Well, this film is... As I said, it's beautiful. In some ways, it's quite simple. Uh, it just takes a great idea... Um, but it pushes it to its logical limit. And it's just so tense the whole way through. You know, it starts with this problem and it just builds up and builds up and builds up and there's not any major um, different lines of thought that it takes you on. It's just this one idea that really works and is pushed to its limit. Oh, so I like that. I haven't, as I said, I haven't seen it. it. Yeah. I like when a film yeah. is a simple idea. So stark but, but, and simple in some ways. Were they, because Nicole Kim and Colin Farrell, they were in The Beguiled as well, weren't they? Oh yes, they were. I haven't seen it yet. Right. They were, and I have. And she's had a great year because she's yeah. she's, she's done good a lot at of really good stuff. And yeah. TV as well. She's yep. had a big yeah. year. And it's a beautiful kind of portrait of withering <clears throat> um, society. Uh, the, the way that they act, kind of, and, and their domestic life is so kind of dry that um, it just has a beautiful effect of kind of feeling like society's dying I think overall the mm. whole thing's quite mm, negative this, in that sense eh? mm, mm. but feel free to chime in is there anything I oh mean, I will oh, in yeah. course well, let's, let's move on then <laughs> and number one film is <laughs> The Square oh mm. I haven't seen that yet neither. neither and this is directed by Ruben Osland uh, that is a Swedish director it's a Swedish film and Swedish subtitles and I describe it as a tightly woven darkly comic Thriller drama with huge political overtones. Um, He's the chap who did um, Force Majeure. That's right. Is that right? The Avalanche. Mm -hmm. And this film won Palm d'Or. Oh, wow. Um, And it was also the opening night film of the New Zealand International Film Festival. That's right. Mm. And so there's kind of a connection here because both these films are about a man with a lot of ego who kind of can't give up his power. Um, It's called The Square because. That is the title of a new exhibition that he's putting on, which is about a 10-foot square, um, which is where you can go and stand in it and you're um, safe. It's kind of considered a safe zone. But the whole thing's a big play on it. It's like, it's actually just this bullcrap idea that you can't have these kind of boundaries that would keep you safe. And, mm. and it's a skewering mm. of, of high art society as well. Mm. Oh, cool. Yeah, um, so overall I really liked that this film has lots and lots of different ideas in it. It's it's not super integrated, and if you like a film to have a very kind of clear message and one clear narrative arc, it might not be your thing, but it's just, uh, these guys are kings of finding little unique moments in life and using them to find out their political significance I'd nice say. yeah nice and nice as well that only one of yours is an American director I mean they're all yeah. men but what can we do but um, yeah. but at least you've got a Greek and a, and a Swede um, but that's kind of my thing I feel a little bit bad about that in some ways because mine's <clears throat> I'm very Euro Europhilic that's great mm-hmm. yeah. you know totally Be- well yeah better than being purely American. American. Yeah. We'll judge the other guys <laughs> later. Maybe even judge me. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, pretty um, much. Sarah, let's hear your top three films of 2017. So, this was a real challenge for me. Um, I have to rate films usually. Um, and so, initially, in this sort of circumstance, I'd go straight to my five star movies. And if I've calculated correctly, I had sort of seven or eight five star films this year. Um, and then a whole bunch of four and a half star films. But as I was reading through my list, I, I thought, well, you know, these five star films, the, the way I rate it is a five star film means this is flawless. I can't think of anything that could have been done better or differently. It's a really terrific film, whether it's worthy or it's engaging or it's important or whatever it might be. But that doesn't necessarily mean I'd want to watch it again. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's a film that I have raved about to mm. people or that has stuck with me in the ensuing days. So I think increasingly I'm looking for films that will stay with me and that 
cause me to feel some sort of exhilaration perhaps in the watching. Mm. So interestingly, my top three for these purposes include one of my five star films and two of my four and a half stars. Um, and so, and it was really challenging to break this down, but we got there in the end. And just sort of thinking about the, so here's my teaser, the connections between, I was thinking, well, what is it about these three that exhilarate me? Um, I realized that one thing that they all have in common is the way that music is used. Now, I shamelessly mm, love... Yeah, I think it wasn't already. I shamelessly love um, classical music, particularly sort of what we might consider the pop classics, um, used in almost a manipulative way. I don't care. Bring <laughs> it on. And my top film um, does that to great effect. We'll get there. Um, and But the other two um, use music in, in a really interesting or compelling sort of way. So that was one part of it. I also enjoy, I realise, from looking at these three, a bit of melodrama. Um, and while the Oh, the, and the acting in all of these three, I think, is wonderful and yet very, very different to one another. But I don't mind a little bit of sort of melodrama, and I like to get some feels out of it. Script-wise, all of them are impressive for being witty and clever and um, a, a little bit different. Um, and I realized another connection is that each of these films has what might be considered unlikable characters, but they are so well played that they're, utter, that they're ultimately sympathetic characters. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, with no further ado, um, my number three, <laughs> what the heck, Ding! is probably Baby Driver. Oh, it was actually okay. only a four and a half star for me, because by the time we got to the end, it had kind of gone on a little bit too long, and it literally, like a car, didn't know, or like a, an out-of-control car, didn't know when to stop. <laughs> but, but there was so much about it, um, and let's bear in mind, I saw this in pre-spacey era, you know, and I really don't want to oh, get true. into thinking about those yeah. sorts of discomforting issues. Um, but I love a bit of Edgar Wright, and I think for a Brit making his way so superlatively in uh, in, in American movies, I thought he just um, I thought he did a beautiful job. I love all the wit in it. I love the lines that made me literally lol in the cinema to everyone's embarrassment. <laughs> the music, of course, the soundtrack and everything's fantastic, and I love the fact that the music was used um, and that the choreography of the scenes tied in with the music. I have no, I, you know, I'm shameless in terms of um, loving that and appreciating that. I don't care that she plays not exactly a waitress in a cocktail bar, but, you know, that, um, that Lily um, whatnot. Evans. L Evans? Evans Collins? Collins, the <laughs> Billy Collins. I don't mind at all that she plays the sort of the, the sympathetic waitress trope. It's absolutely fine. Ansel Elgort from The Fault in Our Stars impressed me enormously as being he baby. He was very mm. dynamic. Yep. Mm. Um, I didn't hate Jamie Foxx. I didn't hate John Hamm. You know, um, John Hamm was awesome. Yeah, yes. and I just had a really good time with it. So I thought all in all it was fun and it was exhilarating. My number two... <laughs> <laughs> You, re <laughs> you may remember this film from such um, top threes as Max Tarrant's and uh, Killing of a Sacred Deer. Hey, did you, number two, number two. It's my number two. <laughs> and again, four and a half stars because around the time that things go um, topsy-turvy in the basement, um, I then start to go, I don't really like this anymore. But it mm. was so flippin' clever all the way up to there, and actually still finished cleverly, and I, I really appreciated what he did, good old Yorgos Lanthimos, mm. um, that I was absolutely delighted by it. Plus, I've been led to believe it's a very discomforting film, um, it's typical Lanthimos, and mm. I had started to think that I was, I'd gone a bit soft in my old age, and um, that I might find it really difficult to deal with, and I, and I absolutely mm. loved it. So I think there's a part of me that feels, hurrah, I'm still alive, <laughs> the, critical, <laughs> the critical thinker in me is still present. Um, I love the dryness of it. I love, I love Colin Farrell's absolutely deadpan Irish accent, just talking in his normal voice, and... And the banality of the script. And I just thought it was just laugh out loud, clever and funny. And I thought all of the acting was superb. So not, not having seen it yet and mm. really, really wanting to. Yeah. Yeah. How would you guys rank it with The Lobster and uh, Dogtooth? I've not seen Dogtooth. I did really, I really liked The Lobster, but I think mm. for some reason, I think Killing of a Sacred Deer I liked more even than The Lobster. Mm. This, in some ways it's quite, it's like obviously it's got his classic kind of way of doing things. 
uh, in terms of the humour, but it's quite the opposite in some ways because lobsters kind of quite unstructured, Mm -hmm. and this film is very clearly structured. Very narrative. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I like the fact that Nicole Kidman uses pretty much her Australian accent, I think. Uh, pr- pretty much, or maybe she's a touch American in it, but I like that Colin's she a bit is, Irish. She, in, in this film, she is Super. absolutely standing out. I'd say yeah. performance of the year for me. Wow. Yeah, she's, she's terrific. Because so she is slightly American anyway in her accent now. I guess. Been in the film. But she I was, guess. I mean, she was fantastic in Top of the Lake, China Girl, and that was a pretty messy oh, season. Oh, she was wonderful. But she was brilliant. And Lion. Yeah, I mean, everything. Lion, this yeah. whole year, I think. And as you were um, alluding to earlier, the, the TV of... Um, Big Little Lies. Yeah. Absolutely and, fabulous. And it was top of the lake as well. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So she was terrific. And Barry Cogan from Dunkirk. You know, I mm-hmm. was watching the log. Uh, hang on. What am I talking about? Killing of a Sacred Deer. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I'm watching it, and thinking, boy, this kid is really familiar. What have we seen him in before? Mm-hmm. And then we're shocked to look him up because he's just the is lad. He the lead? Is in, he the lead in Dunkirk? No, no he's no. just the lad in the the, the, the fishing boat. Oh, right. So it's really quite a small role. The son or the one that um, um, comes he's along the, for the ride? He's the little freckly lad who comes along for the ride. Right, George. Um, George, that's it. So anyway, Barry Cogan was unbelievable in this, completely different. And for, for a young up-and-coming actor, kudos to him. And quite interesting kind of like use of magical realism in this film. Mm. Mm. But because it's, there's something very unusual that happens with this, the powers of this boy and yet it's kind of just brushed over it's just like that's just it's what's just happening it's just accepted isn't it and he's got this power to kind of mess mm. with the family yeah I think that's another reason I, it, I love it it's just as a premise it's beautiful I think that's mm. another reason this surprised me because I normally don't have a lot of truck for magical realism or anything that can't just be rationalised and it's not that I'm a rationalist it's just I like my drama realist um, and you're absolutely right the beautiful way that the film is handled is you just accept it and you just yeah. go along with it and even then when things get a bit silly or a bit ludicrous that's fine mm-hmm. so um, nice number one so my number one golly if I hadn't looked back through my list I would have forgotten this film had even existed which may wow may <laughs> say to you well how good can it be but I went back over the list this is a very much a, I think it was a January release um, and all the Oscars have already happened. It feels very last year to even be talking about it, but Manchester by the Sea Ooh. did everything that I want in a movie. Awesome. The performances were superlative. I love everything Michelle Williams does anyway, and there's that key scene that is absolutely heartbreaking, that if you're not weeping, then you have no soul. Um, Casey Affleck, again, somebody we've all gone a little bit sour on um, this year, but um, Casey Affleck, I just thought the difference between the flashbacks to him being the outgoing guy pre-tragedy and then the the contemporary the contemporary dad um, who suddenly has just sort of folded in on himself and was able to convey so much by doing and saying so little I just thought was superb and the music that I um, alluded to earlier was Albanoni's Adagio which is my one of my many most favorite pieces of music and it was used over the, the flashback to the particular tragedy um, that the film revolves around and there, there needed to be no dialogue at all and we just watched and we just knew everything that was going on and it was magically done. And kudos to Kenneth Lonergan for that, the script writer and director, because it was a risk. I, I don't, haven't read a whole lot about it, but I wonder whether people did think, oh, for crying out loud, you didn't need to manipulate us for that scene. It should have spoken for itself. But I loved that. Oh, nice. There's another film I haven't seen that is on mm. the list. <laughs> I thought it was absolutely terrific. Um, so those are my, uh, ostensibly, my top three for the purposes of Cinema in Context's annual roundup. Mm. Over to you, Jeremy. <laughs> well, uh, I really had to... I, I think I'm on a similar page to Sarah in that I... <clears throat> had to really search deep within my soul about what films would I likely revisit in years to come. Mm. Um, And it was films that I have, all three of them have issues. Um, There were films that I think were better works of perfect cinema Mm. that I've not put on there because for whatever reason, they just didn't connect to me emotionally. Sure. I have a really strong top 10 film list Mm. that I think a lot of the films uh, are asked for. Get Out is on there and, um, and Dunkirk, as we mentioned. And yeah. Get Out's my number 11, actually. So, yeah, so we're on a similar page there. Yep. And I think about my top three, and they are all science fiction films. They're all sequels. Ooh. Two of them, like the seventh and ninth <laughs> in the series. Um, and they, I think, at least look at my top ten, there's a mainstream thread, and I think that's just 
because I've been so full on this year that anything too right. abstract, <laughs> apart from Twin Peaks, um, has been a bit too much for me to handle. Um, so number three, let's get straight into it. <laughs> is War for the Planet of the Apes. Oh my oh, wow. god. Which I know, I think two, two of you have seen. Have you seen it? Yes. Yeah. All right, okay. Um, so... War for the Planet of the Apes, I was sitting there watching it thinking, this has got really strong connections to Apocalypse Now. Um, and I was wondering how overt it was. You know, you've got the Kurtz-like character in, in, um, in Woody Harrelson. You've got, there's the culture of the apes kind of being decimated by war. And then there's a the very explicit <laughs> ape Apocalypse Now drawn in the sewers near the end of the film. So Apocalypse Now is my second favourite film of all time. Mm. Um, yeah, but for me it just worked. I really liked the series. It was a really surprising way to see it. Uh, sorry, see it resolve, um, and I just still really like the idea of making the apes as the protagonists of this of this film. Hmm. Thoughts, team. Oh, I, I have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> share, do share. Oh no, no, no. As in, I have thoughts, but uh, I'll I'll talk about it. Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> okay. all I'll say about your Planet of the Apes is I said I'm not seeing that film over my dead body the minute that Woody Harrelson um, flashed up on screen and I thought perhaps wrongly Jeremy call me judgmental but I thought this is absolutely going to be an obvious sort of anti-war kind of uh, message and I don't need it in my life so there you go perhaps I'm wrong so you've not seen it no because I, I mean I know you weren't as um, excited about it Max as I was no I really didn't enjoy it um <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I need to see it again or something, but I found it... Oh, I think... What did I say? I, I found it um, trying to be dramatic without necessarily having the substance to back it up. And, like, kind of all this... <clears throat> it reminds me of Game of Thrones sometimes. Sometimes I look at Game of Thrones and go, what they're doing is being dark and mysterious to make it feel like it's got drama when it doesn't necessarily have the tension and the drama that hey. it's trying to say yeah, it yeah, has. interesting. And, like, and it's, it's kind of like mm. that. Sorry, it's, yeah. it's kind of like that. That quality that is so popular these days, almost like a kind of epicness. It like goes back to like uh, Batman, the Dark Knight, I think, where it's kind of like this is so big and so deep and intense. And it's like, mm, but actually, is it? I don't mm-hmm. know. I mm-hmm. fair, like... fair point, and I will definitely take that with Game of Thrones because I, I would agree. Mm-hmm. I think for me, what elevated it above just being a, a science fiction thriller blockbuster film was the the, the humanity of the apes. The irony there, um, the fact that they were really close in terms of their characters. The characters were so strong, and there was this real sense of commentary about Syria and. Um, what's going on over in, in, in places where the Western world has kind of put their finger in the pie and there's a lot of destruction of families and children and there was a real clear sense of that in the film with the children apes being separated from the adults mm. and they're in cages. Yeah, and to be fair, I think maybe I, I did probably write it off before even getting to those kind of levels of Apocalypse Now and Syria and stuff. My number two film is... <laughs> Blade Runner 2049. Wow. And uh, again, second, uh, third favorite film of all time, Blade Runner. All three of my films have a connection to my top three, three films. So, oh, so probably going to guess what number one is. Um, and again, Blade Runner. I, I just, for me, that film worked, and for it to work as a sequel to one of the greatest films of all time was it was a feat in itself. Um, yeah, I feel like we've kind of already talked Blade Runner yeah. Yeah. pieces in our previous podcast. Um, so should we just move on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then my number one film, which I watched it again the other night, um, and it's not a perfect film. It's got an issue of clashing of of um, two different moods or styles, and it's also got a third act that is relatively by the numbers. But it is Alien Covenant. Hey. Um, and I, Alien is my favourite film, and to watch the seventh film or ninth, if you want to include the terrible Alien versus Predator films, um, kind of do something really strange and add in layers of futility and purpose and trying to play around with meaning and creation and all that sort of stuff I found really fascinating and and the characters that Michael Fassbender plays in the same scene together often for me just was so outstanding mm-hmm. um, and that sequence in Alien Covenant I talked about it when we did our mini-sode that sequence that starts with the black 
smoky stuff going into the ear mm. yeah. and, and yeah. it ends with the David character shooting a light gun mm-hmm. that sequence is phenomenal and my flatmate I was watching with he'd never seen anything to do with Alien he didn't know the mythology of Alien he jumped when the Alien burst out of the chest oh that's so delightful <laughs> and, and so to watch it with someone who was not familiar with this world was yeah. really thrilling um, yeah any comments about Alien Covenant before we wrap up my top three um, it's it's funny like uh, I I really enjoyed it when I watched it, but I don't, I don't think it really stays, at least in my mind, um, stays at that level as, as time goes on. Um, I think just because I, I you know, ended up reading a lot of commentary and a lot of things, uh, nitpicking it basically to pieces. Um, what kind of things are they focused on? Oh, just, you know, character being inconsistent and really weird things that happen. Um, I think the second act is, is where things start to go to custard before the, mm. the third act kind of becomes more cohesive at least. I think that's a fair point, and that, that kind of shift from the alien tone to the Prometheus yes. tone is both, I think, the weakest point of the film, but also one of the most strangest and most interesting mm. parts. Mm. <laughs> and you get to that stage where David and uh, Walter are sh- playing a flute, yeah. and it's got all sorts of subtext going on in that yeah. um, And it's, goes, it's gone a bit Hobbit by then as well, with that music. <laughs> <laughs> that's awful. But yeah, otherwise, good film. Yeah, yeah cool. I think that's pretty nice place to leave it. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie Covenant when it goes a bit hobbit <laughs> <laughs> William would you like to finish us off and share your top three films of 2017 alrighty my number three dum 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 <laughs> okay so I have something written down for this this year I watched a sombre introspective throwback to 70s westerns masquerading as a sci-fi action adventure where a tired greying hero needs to escort a small mostly mute child while paramilitary forces are in pursuit. The film is, I think, the ninth film in a storied franchise, um, and also an allegory that explores immigration, the Holocaust, and the never-ending cycle of violence. In the final act, the hero must make a critical decision, potentially at the cost of, of his own life, in order to ensure the survival of his people. And the film ends with a fragile hope for the future, and overt Christian iconography. <laughs> so um, that, that's basically Logan or uh, Warful of Planet of the Apes. I, I put Warful Planet of the Apes in front of Logan. Oh, I did nice. love Logan a lot. Yeah. Um, but my number three film is Planet of the Apes. Oh, wow. Wait, um, the same one as yeah, Jeremy's high five. one. High five. Yeah. I've written down Logan. I really expected Logan to be that. But I was thinking, oh. yeah, it's like Warful of Planet of yeah. the Apes. Nice. Um, nice. And they, they are. I mean, after I watched Planet of the Apes, I was like, man, this is... Like, I, I had a lot of the same feelings as I did watching Logan, um, both in terms of the almost nihilistic view of a lot of the, the film, um, the gorgeous cinematography, just a lot of washed out, almost black and white hues, uh, Logan being mostly set in the desert and Planet of the Apes being in a like, snowy wilderness. Mm. Um, but yeah, a lot of things that you said, Jeremy, really ring true. I, I love the consistency of the characters throughout all three of these new Apes, Apes films. Um, I love how you see like actual growth in characters and Caesar as the, the main, you know, the leader of the Apes. He changes and he, his, his view on what is right and what is moral and what is, you know, m- most important for himself, his family and his people. It, it, it's awesome. Um, and I, I mean, it shocks me to, to really think about it. And that they're C- they don't exist. They're CGI creations. Mm. But I think apart from one or two scenes, um, the avalanche scene, mm. uh, to name one, uh, it never struck me for a second that these were not flesh and blood animals, or e- I, not just animals, but actors. Mm. Mm. I think they, they got the, especially the eyeballs. Man, those eyes, they look so real. Mm. Um, and there's, there's a, a real sense of futility and... Of, of there to be no, no sense for the future, for, mm. their, uh, for mankind to be self-destructive, and all these, these big themes. But in the middle of it, you have a very simple story about basically revenge, and about revenge begetting revenge, and how it all leads to, um, I guess, the main character of Caesar uh, becoming something else to both himself and his people, which I thought really, you know, was really beautiful. And, mm. and, and actually, and, and another thing that is there is that there's an incredible sense of harking back to the old films without it feeling shoehorned in or fan Token. it was a fan service is yeah, that sure, sure. you know yeah. Like, yeah so carry on yeah um, so yeah that's, that's my number three film loved it uh, I, I guess with all my three films uh, it is very Hollywood heavy um, <laughs> so take take of uh, that what you will my number two film that 
That's a pretty cool introduction. The sort of 20th century fox kind of movie. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for that. That fanfare for the Lego Batman movie. Oh, <laughs> no way! <laughs> oh, my gosh. Lego Batman. You guys, I love this movie. Um, Just to let our listeners know, we'll be taking auditions for a replacement <laughs> in, in the early in the new year. You I, do you, William. You I, do I, you. I just want to say, there's been no movie this year that I've seen more times both in the cinemas and at home than the Lego Batman movie. So better than Batman vs. Superman. Oh, heck yeah. Better than Justice League. I, I, I think it's a Best Batman yeah, movie yeah. since Dark Knight. And that's, that's I mean, that's pretty simple. You, you, Dark Knight Rises, eh, don't like it. <laughs> um, it's it just a game so I, I don't know. Have all of you guys seen it? I haven't seen it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know you guys are uh, Jackson uh, <laughs> I like this too because I love Batman. Like uh-huh. the mythology of Batman, I am all over it. Um, I wear the underwear and everything. Um, <laughs> and also, I love the Lego movie. So, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the Lego movie, uh, I loved when it came out. And that, that holds a very special place in my heart. And the Lego Batman movie, unfortunately, is not as good. It's not as clever. It's not as funny. And it's not as well-written as the Lego movie. But it's still damn clever. And it's damn funny. And it's, it's quite well-scripted. I would say the, the story, even if you take, take aside all the meta stuff and all the comedy stuff, like it's a pretty good Batman story. And the Joker, you know, he's a legitimate threat. Mm. And, and there's a legitimate character-based, I guess, story that needs to be completed for Batman to learn something about himself. Mm. And yeah, I, I like that stuff. Mm. It's simple, but it's good. Uh, it never kind of uh, oversteps its, its welcome or its ambition, which is awesome. Um, it also just, I mean, it's, it's Robot Chicken, right? It's directed by Chris McKay, who was the director of a lot of Robot Chicken episodes. <laughs> and you can just feel his love for the franchise running throughout the entire movie. Like, it's, it's a hodgepodge of Easter eggs, of real, real weird, like, left-field pits for villains and for, for story stuff. And tied up in this, this weird Lego world. I, I guess the Lego stuff, it doesn't really need to be in the movie, but I appreciate it. Because it makes everything... Um, almost like a, a child's playtime. It's, sure. it's neon colored. It's mm. in your face. Mm. It's um, it doesn't doesn't really ever let go. Like the movie doesn't it doesn't slow down. And the Lego would be the thing that ties it all together, right? Yes. Because otherwise you've got kind of like a Tarantinian sort of oh I like this and I like that and I like mm. this and I'm yeah. going to chuck it all in a movie and you're bloody going to watch it. You know, <laughs> Lego so, yeah. Lego have done something phenomenal in, with that whole brand and mm-hmm. then it sort of started with the different computer games that came out, but. They've created this whole now three films, isn't there? There's yeah. the Ninjago one as well, which is not. I mean, it's okay. I can see but, that but to create a whole brand where it's like we can pretty much grab from any of our partnered mm. brands, yeah. throw it all together, and and get away with it with a certain level of humour. I mean, it's it's pretty phenomenal. I'm sure they're raking in the dollars. <laughs> oh yeah, if they're not with well, their or Lego, they're already <laughs> flipping huge, aren't they? And so that that is my number two. I, I am so sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Mm-hmm. Um, Don't and, apologize, will you? <laughs> my number one film. Da, 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 da. Valerian. Yeah. Yeah. No. Wait, how would you know? Uh, is it? No, it, it well, would have been if, if I had a stupid different I, lead. I thought, <laughs> I thought, I thought it might have been. Yeah, I thought it might have been. Oh, I, I really enjoy Valerian, um, even even though, man, Dana Hahn is most cast. No, my um, my top film is Dunkirk. Oh, oh nice. Uh, uh, some of you have already brought this up. I think it was it was just the right movie for me at mm. that time. Mm. Um, and that I I love Christopher Nolan, but I have been disappointed by Christopher Nolan for his, his last couple of movies. I would agree with that. Yeah, just did not did not care for a lot of a lot of Interstellar, uh, and then obviously Dark Knight Rises. Eh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was a better film than Interstellar. Oh yeah, same. Yeah. I mean, Interstellar was Interstellar was a brilliant film with overstuffed pieces yeah. that needed to be culled. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Carry that's on. a good word. Yeah. Um, and and wh- where I felt Dunkirk, it, it took. I mean, it, it doesn't play it safe. It takes chances on how chronology works and how mm. how you piece a movie together, which essentially takes place over a couple of hours. Yeah. But you have all these these different things happening over different time frames, smushed together, Inception styles. Uh, and still, or well, I think it's cohesive. I, mm. I do some too. Of the yeah, totally. I love, I love that about it. Mm. And, and that's, and it is definitely, it's in my. Actually, I've got it here. It's about number four. Oh, nice. So, um, yeah, I'm yeah, totally with you. I thought it was fourth. beautifully done. <laughs> so, so clever. I mean, for me, um, the only thing that stopped it from becoming in my top three, and and it's the thing with Nolan that his best work has this, and his worst work doesn't, is having a little bit of a sense of humour. Mm. Now, I know it's a war film. 
However, you have one little character in there that adds some light into that, and it would have just lifted the whole film for me, mm. which in The Dark Knight, you've got the Joker. In uh, Batman, you've got um, the Scarecrow. And even in The Dark Knight Rises, you've got the Catwoman character. Um, Prestige, you've got, you've got lightness and, and, and that lifts it. But mm-hmm. yeah, Dunkirk, it's so... Again, yeah. I guess it's a war film, but it's like, you've got to have some life in Yeah, there. it does weigh you down, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Um, but I, I think I, I really like that. I, I know a lot of reviewers have said that, oh, it's so emotionless and it's so, like, by the numbers, people getting blown up, you don't feel anything. But I thought that was the whole point of the movie, that mm-hmm. war is... I mean, it's putting you in these, these poor, poor soldiers, poor kids' shoes, yeah. and seeing... The terror of war is something that's so mundane. Yeah. And your mates war are just justice. disintegrating in it front of your eyes. It should just be. War yeah. justice. Full stop. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, plus, of course, the, the effects and the, the scale of the movie is just brilliant. They're, I mean, you know, a lot of it's shot uh, on camera. Not that much CGI. And the dog fighting, dog fighting looked amazing. The, the mm. stuff on the, the, the beach and the, the mole looked amazing. And it all looked amazing. Yeah. Um, but there's a sense of place, right? As yeah. Well. Wow. Like, oh, holy you, moly. You know this location and you feel like you're there. You hope so, eh? With the, yeah. with the title... <laughs> and Kenneth Branagh isn't annoying. No, and I'm no, not being not. entirely <laughs> flippant when I say that. He's he's, sweet, he's pretty great, great in it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, and that did really well at the box office, right? It did. It did. And which surprisingly so. That's the last thing. That's a, it's amazing that it did well. It, it's not it's really quite an arty film. Yeah. The gunning for it for uh, the gunning for it for um, best picture, aren't they? Oh. They're I'm bringing sure. it back to cinemas to kind of b- drum up some buzz. Wow. Cool. Um, and, and plus, going back to uh, what Cyril was talking about with music. Uh, mm. <laughs> I mean, the score is amazing with mm. its uh, ticking clock motif, mm. but then, and we've talked about this before, Sarah, when they bring in Algar's mm. and Nimrod from his variations mm. in the, at the, the emotional climax of the movie, oh my goodness, it Abs, is amazing. I'm so with you on that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, I've been doing a little tally while we've been chatting, as I did last year. I mean, if you remember correctly, last year, Zootopia ended up being our top film of the year. We've had a very diverse range of films, I think. Uh, only two films have been doubled up. Not um, that diverse, in some ways. It's, it's all still. I just re- I realized before it's all Anglo-American. Well, maybe it's indicative of the culture we live in. Yeah. The films that we typically and the, have come. I, I, I have a movie movies. I really want to talk about, but it's not a good movie. Um, <laughs> let's, let's save it for later. So we've got to kind of split down the table, really. Uh, War for the Planet of the Apes uh, has was a, was a third choice for both William and I. Mm-hmm. However, the killing of a sacred deer. The second choice of both Max and Sarah has reigned our has taken the taken the crown of similar context film of the year, which we both haven't seen yeah. it. So who knows? We might mm-hmm. it might be on our top list as well. Mm. So just to finish our discussion, let's talk about a couple of films very briefly that you that you feel are maybe wild cards. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll start. Um, the, the movie I was referring to earlier was Wolf Warriors 2. It's, um, it's the biggest movie of the year, uh, box office wise, and it's crazy because it only came out in China. Wow. Um, uh, it is also, I mean, you guys, you guys got to see this movie. And this is one you mentioned to us earlier in the year. Yes, You're like, yes. it's so bad, you've got to watch it. it you've got to watch it. And it's, mm. I think it's, it's also scary indicative of how movies will be in the future. Mm. It's fully committed to its Chinese audience in a way that's patriotic, jingoistic, and on the other hand, um, really drawing from 80s action movies. Like, it wants to be the best 80s action movie it can be, mm. but it's also um, uh, brings all the baggage of 80s action movies. Mm. It is fascinating. It's gut-busting and how how insane what's happening on screen is. Mm. Um, I, I, I told you guys, there's, there's a scene where, where one of the bad guys... Um, tells his underling that they cannot attack Chinese citizens because China is a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Flat out dialogue on screen. It's amazing. I haven't actually seen this yet, but I've been thinking a lot about Okia still. I I should have got that before we came to this because I think that could be in my top few, obviously knowing the director. um, Mm, From Mother. That's right, the, yeah. the, the Korean mother, yeah. yes. Not the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, not mother. And, and, it keeps on, and that keeps on coming up for me. That's the kind of thing I keep on recommending to people is the Korean mother and those films. Um, so I feel like Okia has a good chance of being up in my list. Oh, I think it's a fair point. I'd love to see that yeah. film, see mm. the trailers. It just looks really fascinating. I and Tilda yeah. Swinton and it looks incredible. Yeah. I yeah. really like that movie. It's, oh, yeah, you've seen it's it. awesome. Oh, good. I saw it in Tarantino's cinema in, in Beverly Hills. <laughs> You're oh, kidding. I did. <laughs> 
Yeah. Get out. What's your wild card film, Sarah? I have two wild cards. They're the two films that I came out of the cinema this year thinking everybody must see this film. Absolutely gorgeous for their simplicity, for their goodness of heart. And one of those is Brigsby Bear, a charming film whose lead actor, who I believe is a Saturday Night Live alumnus, does, totally deserves to be Oscar nominated for. Um, so Brigsby Bear uh, is definitely one of them. And the other that I saw only recently is Patty Cakes, which is a fabulous film set in New Jersey. And the lead <laughs> nice. is this fabulous actress from Australia, funnily enough, called Danielle McDonald. Um, and she plays a young white rapper. Or she, actually, she plays a, a young white working class oh, young woman living I've in New seen, Jersey. I've seen the trailer for this. It looks fascinating. It's gorgeous. And she, and she spits rhymes and she does it all in her spare time with her pharmacist's best mate. Uh, and they want to hit the big time and they want to record an album and they want to they wanna make it. Um, and the rapping is amazing. And the story, which is, I'd love to say it's a rags to riches story. And it, it, is, it isn't quite rags and it isn't quite riches. But it's one of those people in dire circumstances, you know, following a dream kind of situations. And it's touching and it's perfectly acted. And when you find out later that this girl bears no resemblance whatsoever to a young woman from New Jersey who actually knows how to rap, she's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So actually, she also should be nominated for an Oscar. Um, so Patty Cakes is so highly recommended. It's absolutely gorgeous. I go see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I had not intended to share this film at all, but it was in my top 10 list. And out of the top 10, it is the most left field. Um, and as a big fan of this artist, it's very much a biased choice but Sarah's seen it so she may be able mm. to temper it and that is uh, Gaga 5 foot 2 which is the Netflix Lady Gaga documentary covering mm. her um, I guess return to pop music after being disenfranchised with um, the breaking of her hip and her mistreatment by her management and her kind of running away and doing jazz with Tony Bennett for three years um, and it's a fascinating film and it culminates with her doing the Super Bowl performance which happened earlier in this year um, it's cinema verte in that there's no talking heads. Um, there's a couple of moments of voiceover, but I believe they're all um, either her talking directly to camera in, in her environment or um, found footage. Um, but as a fan, I loved it. But also, it, it, I mean, I've, I've showed it with, to people who aren't fans and they've really enjoyed seeing this very honest portrayal of a pop star who's kind of moved on from... Um, some of the pain of being thrust into the limelight. And talking about pain, a big part of the journey is her fibromyalgia, is that what it is? One of the a psychosomatic um, uh, affliction or disease where she has intense body pain mm. and um, kind of shining a light on that whole journey is fascinating as well. Um, yeah, that's my, my wild card pick cool, for 2017. Well, thank you for listening to another episode of Cinema in Context. If you enjoyed our podcast, then please share it with your film-loving friends. You can listen to Cinema in Context through SoundCloud or through Apple Podcasts. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, which are also great places to let us know what you think of this episode or give us suggestions for future films to discuss and compare. Look out for our next podcast in a month's time, which will be in the new year. And until then, ka kite anō.